Blog Talk Radio. Greetings and salutations unto the most high, true and living God of this creation that lives inside of our hearts, our minds, and our souls. It wouldn't be possible for us to be here if there wasn't a creator of us all. So I acknowledge that who created us. And this is your HempAware host, Tyler Hemp, broadcasting with HempAware Radio from beautiful state of California. On this episode, I'm so blessed and honored to have cannabis author, cultivator, educator, activist, leader, and hemp scholar. And he's also a hemptographer. Paul Van Hartman has been involved in the cannabis and hemp industry for more than 20 years and is truly committed to doing the right thing for the children and the local and global community with cannabis hemp. You'll definitely want to check out his latest book, Cannabis vs. Climate Change, and discover more amazing facts and figures about what cannabis is and what it can do for Mother Earth as an earth medicine to bring about a social change resulting in health, abundance, and harmony for the multitudes. What a blessing and an honor. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Paul. Well, thank you, Tyler. Thank you for all your great works and for inviting me to 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 speak up. Absolutely. Our our show goes by really quick. It's just a 30 minute episode, but we're going to keep it juicy and and rich and hopefully give the people what they want to hear, especially as it relates to the essential solution um for climate change uh, according to your research and and publications. Um I I have kind of a series of questions that I'd love to to get into, but before we start talking about the topic today, uh, cannabis versus climate change, I'd like to learn or at least share a little bit with our, our listeners. How did you first get introduced to cannabis and, and what inspired you initially to, to work with it so closely? Well, I I found cannabis uh, on a recreational level after I left college. Um, I, had, I had made a deal with myself that I wouldn't start something as uh, unknown at that time to me as cannabis until I'd finished my formal studies. And so after I graduated from Humboldt State University in 1978, um, I started using cannabis recreationally. And and a few years later, I broke my neck in a hang glider crash, and I started using it as uh, a medicine, as an herbal therapeutic. And after that, um, I learned about the industrial uses of it and all the the properties uh, that the the hemp industry uh, addresses. And I recognized it as a fundamental solution to many of the problems that we face on this planet. So at that point in 1991, I started Project Peace, which um, was uh, an effort to educate people and also educate myself about the the many uses of the plant. And then in the course of uh, a decade or more, um, I began to recognize that there was a spiritual dimension to the plant that um, had been there all along, but I, I formalized it when my son was born in an effort to reclaim our spiritual freedom to honor nature and to regenerate our uh, respect for something greater than ourselves um, that that nature and cannabis are. Uh, mm-hmm. It's just, to me, uh, been a, a, a process of 25 years of growing appreciation to where now I, I recognize that cannabis is our functional interface with the natural order and our species cannot exist on this planet without cannabis. And elevating, wow. yeah, it's it's really stunning. You know, when you when you start digging deeper and deeper into it, it becomes obvious. You know, our bodies have an endocannabinoid system that is a part of our uh, our systemic balance. In the same way that the Earth has. Uh, systems that maintain the balance of the planet, of Gaia, the organism that we uh, live upon. And so to look at cannabis as 
uh, an herbal therapeutic for ourselves is 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 conceivable to look at it as an herbal therapeutic that helps to keep the planet in balance is uh something that is is still in development for most people but that's what my book and film cannabis versus climate change uh is about really and i i trust that people will keep an open mind when they consider the the relevance of this information in the the time frame that we may have left to make a difference and that's really i think the most important thing to realize this is this is a time limited uh opportunity and cannabis versus climate change is the ultimate good news and we'll be sure to put in the description of this episode links to not only your book but also the video that that you uh, put up on on Vimeo which I'm very excited about and I, let's in just a minute we're going to talk more about climate change and how cannabis uh is a solution or the solution to to overcome this problem that we're dealing with but before we do let, let's talk a little bit more about your history I know you've traveled the world you've been involved with cannabis on many different continents tell us a little bit about you know where you've you've studied with cannabis and 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 the different countries that you've been to, just briefly. You know, maybe well, in just a couple of minutes. Sure, sure. I spent ten years living in Europe. Uh, I I left the United States after being convicted as a a tax protester because I refused to give money to a government that puts people in jail for growing their own medicine. That's just morally indefensible, and I refused to be a part of it. I went to to tax court. And after I, I was convicted, um, I left the country. I went to uh, Amsterdam, and I lived in Holland for two years. I lived in France for about five years. I lived in Switzerland for a while. Traveled throughout Europe documenting uh, on digital video the, the cannabis industry that was operating um, in Europe at the time that my friends and and uh associates in the United States were being arrested and put into jail for cannabis. My friends and associates in Europe were doing incredible things with the plant. And so I made a, a film in Europe um, that uh, essentially attempted to communicate to people in this country what was going on in other countries. And so um, it was a, a, a wonderful opportunity to learn from people um, who had direct experience with the plant and who had overcome many of the problems that people right now in this country are, are attempting to resolve. Um, I've seen it done. I have it on film, and I'm um, trying to, to help keep the, the, the reintroduction of, of hemp in the United States on track to avoid many of the, the pitfalls that um aff uh, afflicted the the uh the industry you know, 10 years ago in Europe when I was there. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm well, so you've obviously been in in the central parts of the world where cannabis is accepted, where it's promoted, where it's utilized for all its different uses. Um so, so tell us a little bit more about your your most preferred or or the most important aspects of the cannabis plant that, that you discovered over the years that, that you love to focus on? Well, certainly the nutritional value of the plant is indisputable. It is uh, a dietary essential, as Dr. William Courtney uh, has, has called it. Um, I uh, a unique and essential natural resource that's far beyond the rightful jurisdiction of any court because it is essential nutrition. And at the same time that it provides essential nutrition, people need to really, really understand this point. It's the only crop that provides complete nutrition and sustainable biofuels from the same harvest, which means that you're not inducing food insecurity and malnutrition by growing your own energy. And that is such a huge, huge thing to say. Um, it's indisputable. I mean, if that was the only thing about cannabis that was uh, for for certain, 
then that would be reason enough to remove it from Schedule 1. But the fact mm -hmm. is, is that cannabis is also the only crop that produces the quantity of atmospheric aerosols, the volatile uh, organic compounds that go up into the atmosphere and reflect solar radiation away from the planet, the UVB radiation that is so dangerous. Um, and and those uh, three things, the, the complete nutrition, the sustainable biofuels without inducing food insecurity, and the atmospheric aerosols that reflect the UVB away from the planet, those three things make cannabis both unique and essential. And we need to start um, looking at the polar shift in values from illegal to essential um, and recognize that time is the limiting factor in the equation of survival. If we don't get on this soon, then no matter what we do, uh, everything that we're doing right now will be inadequate to uh, provide a, a livable planet for future generations. And I'm talking about the next two generations because the way it looks right now is we have uh, just a few years, uh, if that, to um, to make a difference. And there are so many unknowns and, and um, unquantifiable uh, threats uh, that are literally, um, you know, potentiating extinction level events uh, at any mm -hmm. moment that to hesitate at all is um, really irresponsible and, and, and shameful. We've known what we know about cannabis long enough to recognize it as a strategic resource. And it has been identified mm -hmm. in seven presidential executive orders as exactly that, a strategic resource that is mm -hmm. available by essential civilian demand. And mm -hmm. the essential civilian demand part of it is the most time efficient federal protocol for affording access to a crop that could literally uh, prevent the systemic collapse of environment, economics, and the social order. Right, and you actually were part of a forum discussion with the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. Isn't that correct? Yes, I've been participating in the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization's Food Security and Nutrition Forum for more than 10 years, introducing the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations to the nutritional uh, benefits of the cannabis plant. Unbelievable as it may seem, the United Nations had no information uh, about the nutritional properties of cannabis uh, in their in their database, and I started um, introducing research uh, papers that I had had found by scientists of, of global stature uh, that. I had a really hard time getting the United Nations to pay attention to. They just didn't want to know that there was mm -hmm. such a food available with mm -hmm. the agricultural characteristics that made it possible for people to grow their own solutions to their food insecurity problems. And so right. um, I've been banging against that brick wall for more than 10 years um, and have made some some progress uh, with the United Nations, but you know it's it's really the the inertial resistance to cannabis is so deeply rooted in our culture that um, it really is tough to to get anywhere with the United Nations. You might be interested to know that, and and your your listeners might be interested to know that in 1998 I wrote the what was adopted as the uh, manifesto for the world's first cannabis college in Amsterdam. And the name of that mm -hmm. paper was The Fundamental Challenge of Our Time. And it basically mm -hmm. stated that cannabis was too valuable to be within the rightful jurisdiction of any court. And mm -hmm. if you look at the causes of climate change and why we are in the situation we're in, 
um, you can see that if cannabis was never prohibited, we would not be in those uh, in, in that precarious situation with climate change. And so right. and now we have the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, now we have the opportunity to uh, to recognize that the threat of uh, climate change, and in particular the increasing UVB radiation, um, is something that we must responsibly address in a timely way. What what happens when the UVB increases, there are a lot of things that happen, but one of the things that's of greatest concern is the increased solubility of mercury, arsenic, and selenium compounds out of aqueous solution as a result of increased UVB radiation. And these are things wow. that um, are <laughs> so under-regarded and under-reported. It's just um, it, it's Ludicrous. frustrating to me that that you know I'm the one that is introducing these uh, these things into the the common consciousness. You know these are uh, issues and relationships that ought to be addressed by well-funded uh, <laughs> scientific bodies, and and um, and yet um, for some reason somehow. Um, it it, 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 it came run. into my purview, and I'm the one that's that's talking about this stuff. But really, you know, th this should be a matter of international concern and discussion. <laughs> Most certainly. And so let, let's talk a little bit more about global warming, climate change. Obviously, there's several different theories out there. There's several different scientific reports showing you know, chemtrails as being a cause, carbon, um, you know, uh, emissions being, uh, you know, part of the problem. Some say that it's historical, that the planet just goes through these cycles. No matter what the problem is, you're saying that cannabis, or no matter what the, the, the cause of the problem, you're saying that cannabis is the solution because of its ability to produce these aerosols or these, these terpenes into the atmosphere to protect us from these UVB rays? Is that is that kind of the crux of what you're describing here? Yes, and it's also important to, to note that there's no ambiguity in the in in the increasing UVB levels. That that's people can debate about warming and, and, and lots of other things if they want to, but there's really no ambiguity in, in the increased UVB radiation levels. And the fact is that um, there's the, the atmospheric aerosol uh, protection that cannabis affords. There's also the carbon sequestration profile of the crop. There's the, uh, the, 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 the wide range of so soil and climate conditions and the benefits to the soil that uh, cannabis affords. There's the opportunity to divest ourselves from fossil fuels through the production of cannabis uh, fuels that are sustainable and organic and non-GMO. Um, there are a number of uh, very logical, um, inarguable uh, dimensions to the cannabis solution that can only be ignored if people don't want to know the solution, if they don't want to to regard the plant in a positive way. And that's the that's the vestiges of reefer madness that we were born into. We were born into an irrational social prejudice that unfortunately has an economic foothold um, in, in fact, uh, uh, an economic monopoly on our government. And so transcending you, that is is yeah. the object of the game. How do you, what do you feel is the most important actions? You know, the people listening to this show, myself, you, what, people, you know, all across the world, what literally can we start doing today that is, that is going to influence these people that are, quote unquote, you know, the leaders or that are in charge of policy and policy enforcement, you know, what, what can we do to make changes and, and allow cannabis to be grown on a massive scale? 
Well, I think um, there are several things that people can do. First of all, just in the in the debate itself, um, the contemporary cannabis culture has has failed to identify cannabis as essential to our existence on this planet. I think people are so concerned about being judged by the status quo um, that they are um, short uh, selling cannabis short in terms of its importance. And, you know, I've had people tell me, oh, well, cannabis, you know, there's no such thing as a silver bullet that's going to solve all these problems. Well, what that that kind of an attitude does is it ignores the the gold standard science that shows that cannabis is both unique and essential and that is so that is so dangerous if there's a solution and we don't recognize it then that's like not having a solution at all and so and it's, what yeah, i have attempted so to ironic. do is well it it, it is ironic it, you know that um, that the same government that has told us for for 78 years that cannabis is the evil weed with its roots in hell uh, is is now somehow in charge of uh, determining whether or not we can use it, how we can use it. The, the government doesn't even recognize that cannabis has medicinal uh, value. It doesn't recognize the nutritional significance of uh a balance or, or the the health significance of uh, a diet that is inclusive of cannabis seed. The essential fatty acids in cannabis are called essential fatty acids because they're essential to optimum health. We need them, mm -hmm. and cannabis is the best source of essential fatty acids. It's also the best source of organic vegetable protein. The Ediston yeah. protein in the cannabis seed and the albumin protein and the cannabis seed are the fundamental structure of our immune systems. The endocannabinoid system that uh, affords the maximum utilization of the cannabinoids and the terpenes and all of the other components in the cannabis plant is is, is not something that's theoretical. It's, it's a it's a fact, and yet our government continues to to tell us that cannabis has no therapeutic value, it has no health benefits, and continues to keep it in Schedule 1 in, in spite of the fact that they own a patent on the, effect, on the medical effectiveness of the, of the cannabinoid. So there's, there's disingenuity mm -hmm. in government. There's an immoral irresponsibility that is, is directing our uh, misleadership that uh, is is totally related to greed and economics. You know, the the fact is there is no money on a burned out planet. And if people want to see cannabis reintroduced in a timely way, then really we need to redirect investment into the people that understand the value of this plant and are not just trying to get rich um, from selling marijuana to sick people. And mm -hmm. uh, my, my own personal feeling is is that if you don't grow it, you don't get it. You know, if, if you don't yeah. grow the plant, then you're not getting the, the, the message here because mm -hmm. there is so much benefit to growing cannabis for yourself. Um, it really does become a spiritual practice. You know, the, the, uh, the, the traditions of Thanksgiving for the harvest are spiritually founded traditions, and mm -hmm. the violation of our our First Amendment freedom of religion that's going on through the prohibition of cannabis is something that's anti-constitutional. And so, you know, how can we respect a government that violates its own constitution? I, I personally right. uh, feel that the black market has been legitimized by prohibition because mm -hmm. the, the the harms of prohibition are so many and so well documented and, and quantified that to pretend that prohibition is somehow a solution is just not believable. And so, you know, if people want to disbelieve uh, climate change, that, that they do so at, at everyone's peril. But to, to continue to believe that prohibition is anything other than counterproductive is, um, is just a complete fairy tale. You know, we have to get real 
and we have to get real quickly. So if people want to see um, real positive changes, then we have to exercise essential civilian demand for the strategic herb-bearing seed uh, first necessity to the wealth and protection of this country, and that is cannabis. And it's indisputable. Um, I, I welcome, uh, I, I invite people to give me one good reason not to grow this plant, the one good reason that's true. There are a lot of uh, falsehoods <laughs> that are presented mm -hmm. around this, this plant, but the fact is that uh, in, the, in the, the 25 years that I've been doing this work, I have not heard one good reason that's true not to grow cannabis. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I have a lot of reasons that are true um, to, to immediately go out to the Midwest and harvest the feral hemp seed that right now is ripening and falling on the ground um, that we are going to need next spring in order to generate uh, a, a seed harvest. Um, mm -hmm. Cannabis is an herb-bearing seed. It's not a drug. Um, that that distinction is incredibly important um, to understanding the fundamental uh, uh, diversion from from reality that's been imposed on us. And mm -hmm. you know, drugs don't make seeds. I've said this for years. Drugs don't make seeds. Herbs make seeds. You can make right. a drug from an herb, but you can't make an herb from a drug. You know, they're not the same thing. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, all of these things need to be presented in a formal exercise of essential civilian demand for cannabis hemp under the emergency preparedness protocol um, that is referenced in uh, Executive Order 13603, which is currently in force, signed by President Obama in 2012, and also the Code of Federal Regulations, CFR 44, refers to essential civilian demand. And these are things that I'm not making up. These are federal <laughs> documents that have mm -hmm. to do with emergency preparedness. And if people don't think we're in an emergency situation, then they need to regard the the the, the, the economic, environmental, and social upheaval that we're currently facing, and and start considering all solutions before Absolutely. time runs out. Well, it's it's been so powerful and juicy. I really appreciate this talk. We just have about a minute left in, in this hemp episode. So I just want to thank you so much, Paul, for your insight and for your knowledge and dedication and commitment to getting the truth out about this miraculous plant. I, I don't say that about many things, but I do believe in miracles, and I do believe that it's people like you that are going to make it hempen. And I'd love to have you on another uh, episode in the near future. Um, this is Hemp Aware Radio, your host, Tyler Hemp. If you want to hear other hemp episodes or download this one, just go to the podcast library on the iTunes um, channel, or you can check us out, hempaware.com forward slash radio. Also, discover more of what Paul's been talking about on his blog spot, californiacannabisministry.blogspot.com. I'm also going to put up several uh, links to publications that Paul's been involved in, uh, the, the forum discussion that, that he was involved with, uh, with the Food and Agricultural uh, Commission, <clears throat> and uh, some other links to, to what he's described here. Paul, I love and appreciate you, bro. I really look forward to having you on the show again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tyler. And if people want to get in touch with me directly, my email address is projectpeace at yahoo.com, and people can write to me and send support for what I'm doing uh, through my email. Awesome. Please contact Paul. Send him your love. Send him your, your support financially, uh, whatever you can do. Get his message out there. S spread the word on climate, uh, you know, cannabis versus climate change. Go get his book. We'll put a link to his book as well as the video in this, in this uh, episode here in the description. Thanks so much again, Paul. Have a blessed day. I look forward to connecting with you soon. Much love to you, Tyler. Blessings.